Yeah, another episode of The Appreciator with me, your host, PQ River, a.k.a. Brett. Well, actually, Brett, a.k.a. PQ River, because, you know, the real, can you see the real me? Well, this is about as close as it gets uh, with a microphone in front of me. Um, uh, first off, uh, R.I.P., rest in peace, the Iron Sheik. You remember the Iron Sheik? He was a professional wrestler, and uh, way back in the 80s, yet before a lot of you even... Boy, that the old geezer's at it again. The Iron Sheik was the uh, tweener, as they call it, uh, the champion for a very brief time between the long-standing Bob Backlund and uh, Hulk Hogan, who then brought professional wrestling to great peaks in the early to mid 80s and then onward. And to this day, I mean, the name Hulk Hogan is pretty well known, although finally the man is retired. I mean, he kept going with hip replacements and all sorts of health issues. Uh, but we're talking about the late, great Iron Sheik, who uh, competed in the Olympics for uh, Iran way, way, way back in the 70s, if I'm not mistaken, came over to the U.S., uh, worked with Vern Gagne's AWA, which, you know, back in what they call the territorial days, uh, professional wrestling used to exist in different regions of the United States different wrestling companies having uh, and agreed upon, you know, New York was uh, the McMahons, uh, Vince McMahon's father, Vince McMahon Sr. Um, the Minneapolis area and certain parts of the Midwest was Vern Gagne's with his AWA. Uh, a lot of the country, uh, the biggest promotion was probably the NWA, but that was more a cooperation of a bunch of smaller, like mid-Atlantic wrestling, etc. And uh, Detroit had its own wrestling uh, that the original Sheik not to be confused with the Iron Sheik, uh, ran. So it, it used to be these little niches, and they ran on these TV shows, and mostly of their money came from people actually going to the matches. And today it's all very different, and we don't need to go into that. But the Sheik uh, worked for Ganya in his AWA and went over to Vince McMahon's seniors WWWF, the Worldwide Wrestling Federation, which later became the World Wrestling Federation and is now known as World Wrestling Entertainment. Uh, see, now you know. It's just you know you didn't think you would know all the all about professional wrestling. And the Iron Sheik uh basically was a bad guy who was at the Back then, the good guys were good guys and the bad guys were bad guys. So in order to change the belt from good guy Bob Backlund to good guy Hulk Hogan, uh, face as they call it, uh, good guys are called faces, bad guys are called heels. Uh, Iron Sheik was brought in as a heel wrestler and uh, held the belt for a very short time and then lost to Hulk Hogan and Hulkamania was born. Uh, he later went on uh, and did a bunch of wrestling over the years and uh, became pretty much a caricature of himself, kind of a human trope. Uh, if you go on YouTube, there's all kinds of uh, crazy, ranting raves that are kind of funny. If it wasn't for the fact that it's obvious this guy has some uh, issues, uh, but it, funny stuff. Uh, nonetheless and uh he's gone on to that big wrestling ring in the sky um r.i.p iron chic and uh a, a couple of more podcasts that i have appreciated over the years the other day i mentioned uh john wilson's golden age superman podcast and uh in the same Superman vein, uh, there was a podcast. There still is. It kind of runs sporadically, but they stay at it. They started it way back in like 2009 from Crisis 
to crisis. And uh, what they tried to do and are continuing, to, it, it's a long haul they're going on, from when they changed Superman back uh, in the uh, Crisis on Infinite Earths around, what, 1982? 83, somewhere around there, uh, DC Comics, the comic company that publishes Superman and Batman and Wonder Woman, their continuity over the years became so irreconcilable with all these stories and revisions that they decided to revamp and start fresh. So they had the Crisis on Infinite Earths, where they stopped everything and started anew. And... Um, a little later on, uh, about 20 years later, in the early 2000s, they had another crisis, and once again, because it didn't take them long to mess continuity and comic books and this strict pedantic thing just don't go together, and they try and they try, and it's still not going to work. Um, I'm, it's unfortunate. But uh, I think they need to do it all over again now for any number. I mean, well, what they've done to pander to I don't even know who is all of the superheroes and both companies have done this. Suddenly Thor is a girl. This one, Spider-Man is Hispanic. Uh, and I, I, if people were buying comics and it was popular, I keep the form alive, but... I don't see that happening. And I really grew up and appreciate the comic book form. Uh, it's really an interesting storytelling form. It's very pulpy. It's a low art thing. And all attempts to elevate it, yes, there are a few things that uh, have been very artsy and very good, but by and large, most of them have never sold or sustained themselves. I mean, the, the big deal for years was uh, Art Spiegelman's Mouse, which is a very intriguing story uh, about uh, Jews during Nazi Germany and this family saga. And it was told in a graphic novel form, and it got incredible press and sold many, many copies. But I, that's, it, it, it's not going to sustain, and it's not going to be bought. Comic books are for kids, and I think that's far too forgotten. I mean, us grown-ups, yeah, we, we can slum a little and read some comics, but, you know, in the days when I was reading comics as an adult, it's always this weird furtive thing, and now really, you know, adult comics. First, there was underground comics with guys like R. Crumb and the fabulous furry freak brothers and numerous knockoffs, imitations, and uh, homages to that whole genre. But uh, once mainstream comics started being more adult, that whole thing collapsed. And I don't think it was ever, I don't think R. Crumb ever to this day got rich from doing comic books he's recognized like a lot of artists are that you know i mean thank goodness he makes enough and he functions now he's kind of an old guy and uh, many people have seen that film crumb although even that now is fading into obscurity but uh to get back to what i was talking about the big digression from the appreciator um the from crisis to crisis podcast is swell and it goes on and on, uh, episodically going through what Superman has been for, well, now he's something completely different, of course, but taking him out of all those old tropes dating back to his origination and basically starting him from scratch. And I was pretty excited at the time because I always felt that John Byrne, uh, comic book writer and artist who'd done amazing things with the Fantastic Four in the 80s would take Superman and run with him and really do something cool. But uh, editorial heads prevailed, and I don't think Byrne lasted a year uh, as the writer-artist of Superman. 
And the permutations and all the weirdness is fascinating in and of itself. And because Superman is so iconic. I mean, almost everybody has a vision of Superman, whether it's the old TV show, the black and white George Reeve TV show, or the Christopher Reeve era, or all the uh, modern Superman DC Universe ones and the Justice League. But there's no consistent Superman anymore besides that he's Superman. And that in and of itself, like I say, like Batman, uh, Batman, Superman, Spider-Man, and a little bit Hulk are probably the real iconic superheroes of the comic book world. And uh, again, uh, Crisis to Crisis, the podcast, is well worth, if, if you're the type of person who wants to listen to an ongoing serialization index program, it's one of the longest running ones, and it's quite fine. Uh, there was another one going that did uh, that covered the Fantastic Four all the way up to issue 232, ironically um, ending on the first issue where John Byrne uh, went to the Fantastic Four and kind of created a renaissance uh, by paying homage to the originator, one of my heroes, Jack Kirby, who can be said to have had a great hand in creating the entire entire Marvel Universe. Jack Kirby in and of himself is amazing. And uh, all of these people... I definitely appreciate. And uh, the Fantastic Cast is also a really cool podcast on comics. And if this kind of thing appeals to you, absolutely you should check it out. Um, and uh, with my lifestyle changes for years, and I mean years, my go to beverage has been the uh, lemon lime, like chartreuse colored. Gatorade. It, it's got electrolytes. Um, and it, it, it hydrates you, whatever they say. And it was sweetened with real sugar, not corn syrup. Uh, just that flavor. You can't rely on all these other flavors that came after. The lemon lime was the original Gatorade flavor. And like I say, for years and years, that was my go-to beverage. On a hot day, I would drink a ton of it. And, uh, I now drink a lot of water. Uh, I drink a lot of teas more recently. Um, herbal ones, and you know, I, I'm not like off caffeine, but I was like an over half a gallon of coffee a, a day kind of a guy. I mean, in my earlier podcasts, you hear me talking about my quart size cup of coffee. And um, even on a hot day, I find a hot cup of tea, once it's in me, makes me feel cool. And uh, I'm not adding sugar. I mean, even when I drink coffee, which I'm weaning way down, uh, it's black, black as midnight on a moonless night, as uh, Agent Cooper of Twin Peaks used to say. Um, that was one of my favorite TV shows, to digress a little. But uh, tea and teas are something that... Uh, if you're trying to cut back on the sugar, and uh, I don't know how healthy or unhealthy the herbs and the herb teas are, and I, like I say, I'm not talking about Lipton tea. I mean, sometimes I'll have an Earl Grey or a green tea, which has some caffeine in it. But still, I mean, no milk, no sugar, just however the tea turns out, and uh, it's refreshing and nice. And uh, but the other thing I like to do is get some like really good, not from concentrate orange juice and some uh, bubble water or seltzer and make like a, what, a spritzer or something they call it. Just a little bit of the nice orange juice and some seltzer. And that, that's very refreshing. And again, corn syrup in sodas and drinks, it leaves a film in my mouth. It's not thirst quenching at all. And the idea, especially in hot weather, of drinking a liquid is to quench your thirst and, and drinking a lot more water, uh, which, hey, 
the human body is what 60 percent water so replenishing it when one is hot and dehydrated seems to be not so bad an idea and uh, going along with uh, what i've been talking about more thick and sade um, I don't know if I'm going to make this a temporary staple of the show, but since I control the vertical here on The Appreciator and listening to these shows after many years of not, this is just, it, it makes me feel good. And I hope uh, some of you, at least, if not all of you, are getting a kick out of stepping back and getting ready to smile again with Radio's Home Folk because, uh, and well, I do promise, maybe even the next show, more Jimbo. Um, these are things that make me feel good. And if I'm going to do this on any regular basis and enjoy it, of course, i got to do stuff that feels good, right? Well, sir, it's late afternoon as we enter the small house halfway up in the next block now. And here in the living room, we find Mr. Victor Gook and his son, Mr. Rush Gook. The gentlemen are standing between the bookcase and library table. And something about their demeanor suggests something of a solemn nature goes on. Listen. Sky, really good stuff. You are a bubbly with a broken wing. Your comrades who are assembled bitterly and the women outside the castle gates tear their hair in agony. The goldfish darts in the plashy pool and the nodding rosebuds perfume the ambient air. Sky where they got stuck, scream like a wounded panty. Ouch! Funny stuff, huh? <laughs> yeah, we walk through, guys. No. I'd like to go over to Tannin's vacant lot pretty quick. You've been paid ten cents for your time and you've only been here about fifteen minutes. I feel like I've been here two hours. Now just relax. I'll dismiss you in due season. Oh. I believe I'll go over the first part of my speech again. I was a little rocky in spots. Mm. Stay with a good stuff, grovel and wine. <laughs> what did I say about the funny stuff? I didn't think you could hear me. Will you straighten up and quit the horseplay? Mm. And quit fidgeting around. You're enacting the role of a man who is being expelled from the lodge. You're supposed to be upset and grief-stricken. And I suggest you wipe that silly smirk off in your face. Mm. Hey, really good stuff. Grovel and whine. The salt tears furrow your cheeks and your palsied hand trembles with the sorrow you have brought upon yourself. When the amber moon hangs like a lantern in the ebony sky and the cry of the loon echoes through the timbered terrain, recollect that the heart is only flesh and blood and the spirit is but a cup of pain that me. bubbles and simmers. A bitter brew indeed, Sky with a good step, but the Thank penalty you. for human weakness is wishing to hide. You got company? No. Talking over the telephone? No. I'm here, ma'am. Oh. Shall we try again? I think you know your piece well enough, Gov. You whipped it out as smooth as goose grease. Stand up straight, please. Mm. Sky with a good step, hearken to the words of our founder, R.J. Conk. In hock, spit it hunk. Ed Agricola non disputandum hunk. Sinus treble dumb cock nomenclature est. Cornucopia some cabbage bolo exit steam. Come Lord near the. What's all this? Hi, Mother. Hi. Your father initiating you in the lodge? I bet it looks like it. We're busy here, Sage, if you don't mind. No, I don't mind. What you doing with your pajama coat on? <laughs> Dad's going to pull the buttons off of it in a minute. He is. Says he is. What for? I am rehearsing something, Sage. At meeting tonight, it'll be my duty to expel Hank and stop from the lodge. You're forever expelling him from the lodge. Now, this time, it'll stick for a while. At any rate, until it'll stick until he pays up his dues. When he pays up his dues, he'll be reinstated again? He will be reinstated again. Well, I don't see why you fellas bother. There is no necessity for your being in any way concerned in the matter. Don't worry. I'm not concerned. Shall we resume, Rish? Yeah, let's get through. I'd like to go over to the tavern's vacant lot. Stand up straight and quit teetering back and forth at your heels. That gets restless. You're supposed to be Hank Gutstop, Willie? Uh-huh. <laughs> Wonderful part you got to act out. Well, you should fret. Goes paying me a dime. When you people have quite finished your jolly chat, I'll go ahead here. Want me to leave the room? You may suit yourself. Can I stay if I'm quiet? All right, Gresh. Shoot. 
By all right, Rush, I mean I'm about to continue the ceremony. I mean I'd like to have you wipe that foolish smirk off in your face. Mm-hmm. I'll try the second part again. Okay. I wasn't asking your permission. Very oh. really good step. You are a bubbly with a broken wing. Your comrades who are assembled here weep bitterly. And the women outside the castle gates tear their hair in agony. The goldfish darts in the flashy pool, and the nodding rosebuds perfume the ambient air. Sky brother got stopped, scream like a wounded panther. Oh. And this place is full of comedians. <laughs> I was helping Rush. Will you cease helping Rush? All right. I want to be letter perfect in these speeches tonight. I want things to go off without a hitch. You memorizing that trash? I question the good taste of the term trash. You memorizing it? I am memorizing it. Well, just a month ago, you memorized a lot of stuff. And that was to throw Hank out of the lodge with. Is this something different? This is something different. I don't see why you fellas bother. Actually, I don't. All right, Rush. Chin up. Mm-hmm. Spare with a good step. Gravel and wine. Gravel and wine, I say. You insist on this side spitting humor, act. <laughs> well, I didn't think you could hear me. I heard you quite clearly. Say, I appreciate you don't attach any importance to this. You couldn't be expected to attach <laughs> Go any ahead. importance. Go ahead. I won't bother anymore. I believe it is quite cool out on the front porch. <laughs> Let me say, I won't bother anymore. Shoot, Gov. Kindly do not keep reiterating the phrase, shoot, Gov. Oh. Very really good stop. Gravel and wine. Gravel and wine, I say. Don't waste anything, Gov. Keep going. Gravel and wine, I say. The salt tears fur your cheeks and your palsied hand trembles with the sorrow you have brought upon yourself. When the amber moon hangs like a lantern in the ebony sky and the cry of the loon echoes through the timbered terrain, recollect that the heart is only flesh and blood and the spirit is but a cup of pain. Now, the simmers. A bitter brew indeed, Sky Brother got stopped. But the penalty for human weakness... Now, Father, you will answer it, somebody. Say it, you're right here. All right, all right. Don't bite a person's head off. I can't accomplish any more around this place than a rabbit. Hello? Yes. Yes, I believe he is. Rush. Bluetooth, Johnson? Yeah, some kid or other. You're not positive it's Bluetooth? Yeah. You are positive it's Bluetooth? I don't know. Here, see for yourself. Very likely it's Rooster Davis. Yeah. It is Rooster... Where do you take this receiver? Probably Leland Richards. Hello? Hi, yes, Smelly. Smelly Clark, by George. Mm. We're kind of shy. What's up here, Smelly? Smelly? When? This evening? Huh? Be delighted. Be delighted, Smelly. Why don't you come back after supper and yell? <clears throat> sure. Sure, that's fine. Okay. <clears throat> I'll be looking for you, fella. You bet. Okay, Smelly. Tom, Smelly and myself are going down to the YMCA tonight and watch the fat men play handball. Mm. Come over here, would you? And let's get on with this. Oh. Interruption after interruption after interruption. All right, I'm going to recite the Latin speech again and then continue with the active portion of the ceremony. Would you make an attempt to stand up straight? Sure. All right. Shoulders back. Chin up. Hands down the side. Mm-hmm. Sky with a good step. Talking to the words of our founder, R.J. Kump. Did hop spitter punk. Ag agricola non despitendum punk. Sinus trouble dumb clock nomenclature yes. Cornucopia some cabbage bolo exit steam. Come lord nil busy chump. Sky really got stop. I remove from your tunic. Hey, what are you doing there? Stop. Sadie, may I inquire where you... Were you going to pull the buttons off in that boy's pajama coat? I most certainly was. Well, if that's not the bullet that choked Billy Patterson. It's part of the ceremony. When a man is expelled from the lodge, the buttons are ripped off in his coat, vest, shirt, and underwear. I gave Rush here a dime to enact Hank's role in I don't care if you give Rush nine dollars to enact Hank's role. Them pajamas are brand spanking new. Why, the idea... A great big grown man acting like some Never little mind. tiny Never baby. You run that lodge craziness in the ground to a place where a person wonders if you fellas in your Never lodge are quite okay. civilized. Ripping the buttons off in a perfectly good pair of pajamas. Uh, I don't think you can hear you, man. It's way out in the kitchen. And I never heard of such silliness. Oh. 
Oh, yes. <laughs> Goodness. Uh. <laughs> the stuff that goes on. Uh. Funny. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my. I expect we've made Gov mad. Mm, I expect. Sky, brother, got stop. Gravel and wine. Gravel and wine, I say. <laughs> <laughs> Sky, brother, got stop. Scream like a wounded panther. Oh. <laughs> I'll say. Yeah, yesterday's show when we played some Vic and Sade, I mentioned Vic's Lodge, that this was a, a real Lodge episode, complete with uh, the ceremony to remove a member and, and, and that fake Latin that Paul Reimer wrote, it's a sick, cuddle, dumb cluck. It just, just priceless humor, and the funny stuff too. And just watching the fat men play handball, and and going to Tapman's vacant lot. I mean, it's somebody else's nostalgia. But these really sound like things I wish I had done growing up when I. Going to watch the fat men play handball. Whatever happened to those fat men? Um, whatever happened to the term? Well, you're not allowed to call people fat anymore, even as a joke. I mean, I'm a real skinny guy, and people can call me skinny in the most derogatory and like. But to call somebody fat affectionately is like a horrible thing, and I don't know calling people things. I grew up in a different era where that was just, you know, they had all kinds of ethnic jokes and people of that ethnicity were the best at telling them. But now, uh, I don't know. It, it makes maybe for a kinder world. I, I don't know. Because, you know, we all cling to what we're used to, but I don't cling enough. You know, I'm not going to go out and do what would be considered politically incorrect stuff. I used to feel rebellious and do that, but I'm even shy to do that voice that Jimbo liked me to do, the the Southern guy, the Texas guy. But um, I, I, I may try him out here, and I hope, I hope none of you people down south get all riled up. And that's even a poor example. When I get going, it's at least some people find it amusing. When <laughs> it's a little shtick, and um, there's nothing wrong with a little shtick. I think we've all become way too thin-skinned and sensitive, and you know, fatty Arbuckle. So he was a fat guy, and he, they called him fatty. But I don't know. Was his feelings ever hurt? Um. And, you know, I know it's, it's a condition that now is considered um, to be less than. I guess history of the future will tell us uh, what this all means and whether or not it's good or bad. I mean, people are going to call each other something, uh, either being friendly or being a foe. And... That's just the way humans are. And it's, it gives flavor to something. And looking now to future shows, yes, Jimbo, I would like to do some uh, film recommendations because uh, now more than ever, although the films I watch, I, to me, an old movie is something from the 30s, maybe the 40s. I think I mentioned this before. And to most people, like the 80s is forever ago. And yep, the 80s are forever ago. Um, I, there's no getting around it. Um, the American movie classics, I remember in the 80s feeling like because they were only showing 50s movies as old. Uh, I was like, what these aren't old, but our culture, and I guess any culture, what at the last, if something's more than a couple years old, it's old news, it's no longer current pop culture, and hence, I mean, I say I'm a pop culture maven, but I'm an obscure and old 
pop culture maven at best uh, when it comes right down to it. Um, maybe some more comic book talk. I'd really, I uh, recently was reading the very first Marvel comics, and uh, perhaps, yes, I think that would be a good thing because I really, I have an appreciation for the innocence that it's the... Uh, early days of a form, so there's a lot of uh, trial and error and an innocence about the old comics, uh, including, well, unfortunately, by modern standards, uh, the the Golden Age comics, just like uh, radio and everything else in the day, had a certain uh, politically incorrect bend by today's standards. Although I have to say, except for talking about fat men and things like that, and Sade being a literal housewife, which does that even exist anymore in today's culture? Um, They're pretty politically correct all the way around. I mean, even shows like Jack Benny, which was the biggest show on radio, uh, he had his uh, sidekick valet uh, chauffeur, Rochester, who was uh, a black guy who, uh, he was funny and at times perhaps was belittled in a very, by today's standards, cruel way. So uh, modern audiences, especially young people, they're just not going to go for that now, are they? Anyways, I'm over time. Uh, This is a long appreciator, but uh, thanks for being here, and uh, we'll be back again very soon. And in the meantime... Of course, set the controls for the heart of the fun.